I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. <laughs> Keeping the palms joined. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. So this Buddhist practice stuff can uh, can get kind of boring. It really can. I mean, how exciting is it to try to be nice to people every day? How exciting is it to try to be mindful of what you say every day? How exciting is it to try to build a practice to where you sit and do absolutely nothing for 20, 30 minutes a day? Does that sound fun? Any of that stuff? It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And that's very difficult for a lot of us with most things in our lives because we're used to things being kind of this progression and we're often used to this thing of like, okay, well, have I succeeded yet? Have I accomplished it yet? Have I achieved it yet? Have I attained it yet? Or what is next? You know, often people ask me, I've been calling this intro to Buddhism for, you know, 10 years. And people say, well, is there an advanced class? <laughs> you know? And I say, well, let me know when you can go one day and do nothing but think good thoughts, speak good words, and do good deeds all day. And then I'll let you know when the advanced class is. Um, thankfully, nobody has ever taken me up on that. Uh, otherwise, I'd have to find or figure out when or where the advanced class is, right? There's different approaches to Buddhism. There's different techniques. There's different styles. There's even here, we have a ton of different people who lead with their own ways of practicing. But for me, it's not a fun, exciting thing. It's just, bless you, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And every time you sit down for me, right, when I sit here and I lead, it's like, okay, this is the first time I've ever sat. This is the first time I've ever led. This is the first time this moment has ever occurred, because it is. And that's, to me, the practice, is just doing this moment over and over and over again. And that takes uh, a little bit of discipline. It's a lot of bit of discipline, actually, but it takes a little bit of discipline. It takes uh, kind of the fun out of it. And for me, that's what's made this practice so successful is letting go of this idea that any grand thing is going to ever happen to you from this path, right? But if this path and this practice of meditation and looking at what the Buddha taught makes you a kinder person, makes you a happier person, makes you a gentler person, makes you a more forgiving person, makes you a more loving person, makes you closer, as I was talking to somebody downstairs, if this practice makes you closer to whatever religious faith you may have, then that's all beautiful. So that, to me, ultimately is what the practice is about, day in and day out, being aware of what you think and what you say and what you do, and just doing that on repeat over and over and over again. 
And uh, that's why over years we see so many people who kind of they start with practice and they fade away and they start and they fade away. Um, and the reason people fade away from it is different, but this is just a simple reminder that it's just a very slow, monotonous, boring path and practice to try to be nice. Anyone here nice to everybody all day long other than Al? I saw another hand. There's usually one. Oh, of course. No hat tonight. Oh, he's got it. All right. Almost didn't recognize you without the hat, you know? All right, so with that, we'll start with the meditation practice. This, is, this will be the fun part. Um, a couple things to tell you before we begin. Nothing's going to happen to you, right? Not going to float away. Not going to have any mystical, magical experiences. The mind that races all day long is not going to shut off. Don't judge your practice. I mean, you don't ask yourself, is this working? Is this not working? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? We're just going to sit. We're going to breathe. You're going to hear sound, sounds inside the room, sounds outside the room. Um, this is life. Life is filled with chaos. And the practice of meditation is learning to get quiet and still within all of the chaos. Don't judge your practice. I mean, you don't ask yourself, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? Uh, we're just going to sit. We're going to breathe. If you stop breathing, it's going to be very difficult for the rest of us. So please do your best to keep breathing. Posture. Uh, you just want to be comfortable if you're on the cushions. Often helps slide into the front third, pushing the stomach forward, allows the back to straighten. Shoulders are relaxed, hands are on the knees or in the lap. If you're on the chairs or benches or laying down, just also be very aware of posture. Shoulders relaxed, hands on the knees or lap. Moving if you need to move, but also being aware of your posture and working on learning to stay still. I'll guide us as we begin. We'll settle into a little bit of silence be done by midnight. Starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth open or closed. Start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. And eventually, settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. Releasing the mind as it wanders, jumping from thought to thought. Gently guide the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. Breathe 
everything in. Feel them rise. Breathing out. They fall. Simply continue this practice, observing sensation of breath, expecting nothing but to sit and breathe. As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognize it, release that thought, return attention, focus to the breath.
Where is your mind? Return to breath. Keeping the mind alert. Aware of each sound. thought each physical sensation Concerned with nothing but sitting, breathing.
with the body still rested. The speech quiet, aware of all sounds. And the mind learning to settle. Know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath, there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. No one else to be. Everything beautiful, just as it is. Sitting, breathing. And once again, taking three deep breaths slowly. Slowly open the eyes. Slowly begin to move. The most important practice meditation is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day. Recognize the difference, if there is one. Ask yourselves how you prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life. And realize every you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, still, or a busy mind, racing mind, whatever you're sitting with at this moment <coughs> has nothing to do with anything I said. It's nothing to do with how we sit and hold the hands across the legs. It's nothing to do with the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It's everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samuppata, means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awakening. He was a human being no different than anyone in this room who began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the causal relationship of all phenomena. What that means very simply for every one of us in this room 
regardless of where you come from or what you believe in and where you think you're going, your whole life is filled with things that happen. You react. More stuff happens, more reactions. This practice is learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way you responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how you respond to everything else that's happening throughout your day. So all we're working on is closing the gap to the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just as driven, motivated, productive, successful, whatever that means to you in your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one. This practice is not necessarily easy. It's not necessarily fun. As I spoke about in the beginning, meditation is not an escape. Buddhist practice is not an escape. It's direct perception into this present moment. It is becoming fully aware that everything that you have thought, everything you have said, and everything you have done that created the life you have today. Nobody else put you in this position. You did. Sure, there were lots of things that happened around us. Some pleasant, some unpleasant, some neutral. But regardless of the external conditions, we make choices every day on what we think and what we say and what we do. And for me, that's why, as I spoke about at the beginning, yes, the practice itself to me at least, it's kind of boring, but it's extremely rewarding. To work on thinking good thoughts, speaking good words, doing good deeds all day long, and knowing that if I do that, I will suffer less, sign me up. To me, that's the essence of this practice. That's what it's about. That's what the Buddha taught. He wanted people to suffer less. Very clearly, very directly. He initially taught to a group of monks and nuns. He wasn't teaching them so they could be happier at work. He wasn't teaching them so they could be happier in their family relationships or their you know, relationship dynamics. He wasn't teaching them so they could manifest everything they wanted in their life. He was teaching a group of people initially who had left all of the lives that we all live Initially, they left those lives. They unplugged, they renounced, and they lived very simple lives. And then the Buddha eventually brought the teachings into the lay community. For me, when you look at the heart of the Buddhist teachings, I like to look at what he taught to the monks and nuns and try to figure out on my own, how does that apply to the lay life? And that's what I think over the last 2000 years that people have been so successful at doing, which is taking the heart of Buddhist teachings around understanding our cravings, our desires, our attachments, the things we feel we must have and must need in our lives. And he taught to lay people, and for the last, as I said, 2,000 years, people figured out great ways to help us attach less, crave less, desire less. You don't hear have any attachments, cravings, desires. It's all day long. I crave the temperature to be cooler. Stop craving that. It is in the act of craving that you are suffering. And to become aware of that is very important. These are things to look at throughout your days, whether you're the monk or nuns or lay people like those of us in this room. What do we crave and desire and attach to on a daily basis? 
That's the renunciate path, is to become aware of that. My master used to say, shaving your head, putting on a robe doesn't make you a monk. It's becoming aware of what in your life can you renounce? What in your life can you move away from that is potentially causing you suffering? And if you think back to you know the 20 minutes that you had where it was just quiet and simple and still and slow, your entire day could be that way. Just as active, just as engaged, just as productive, getting as much done but not wrapped up in all the crap that most of us are wrapped up in all day long, what everybody else thinks and says and does. I'm sure nobody spent any time at all today thinking that somebody should be doing something other than what they were doing. I'm sure you were perfectly happy with what everybody else around you did today, right? Right? Our attachment to wanting people to be a certain way is uh, causes a lot of suffering. Which is funny because there's somebody out there right now in this world that wants you to be a certain way. So ponder that for a minute. You're being who and how you are. And they are being who and how they are. So I'd rather just stop there and open up to questions, meditation, Buddhist practice. But I'd always prefer to just address whatever's on your mind and go from there. <coughs> yeah. Um, so I was wondering, is there a way to bring up this practice of meditation into daily life? Um, like a way, for example, do you, do you find a way to find um, technique or tools to like bring yourself to the present moment, kind of similar to what we do in this meditation. Yeah. In our daily life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the to me to have a whatever the length of time doesn't matter if it's a five minute, a twenty minute, an hour long meditation to have that meditation time where we do a seated or laying down or walking meditation and not have the ability to bring it into our daily lives. It is, I don't want to say worthless or meaningless because it's still beneficial. You know, the five minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, however long you sit, doesn't matter. That quiet stillness time is important, but we don't live our lives that way. We live our lives engaged in the world, you know, whatever it may be. Um, whatever our profession may be, everything is moment to moment to moment. Ultim ultimately, meditation is a concentration and focus on the present moment. Right? So that can be anything, as the Buddha taught. Right? Sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Right? If I'm eating, pay attention to eating. If I'm driving, pay attention to driving. If I'm walking, pay attention to walking. Whatever I'm doing, concentrate on it at that moment. But what we often do is we're trying to be present with one thing. Right? And we're thinking about everybody else. What are they doing? 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 Here we sit in the middle, and there's like five people around us. And we are so focused on what each one of them is doing. And we get really good at that. And it helps us with our craft. But to try to balance learning to be present while trying to control and manipulate others is very difficult because what we're actually strengthening, you know, if you think of any work dynamic and if you have people you work with, right, they don't do what you want all day long, just like you don't do what they want all day long. And so we spend so much time trying to get ourselves wrapped up in these work dynamics with colleagues. And what we're actually doing in that moment is strengthening kind of like any other muscle we strengthen this idea of trying to control and fix others. And the practice of Sita meditation is then done. So when you go into these other environments, you know, while you were sitting here tonight during meditation, did you have any care in the world for the most part about what anybody else in this room is doing? No. 
Are there any other moments in your day where you're around 80 people and you don't care what they're doing? No. no. <laughs> you see the gap there. There's a huge gap. So is it possible? Yes. Is it easy? No. And that's why I talk about this practice just being that repetitive, monotonous, training the brain, training the mind to be present, to be present, to be present every single day. And then when you get up and you leave here, right? And you go to a restaurant or wherever you go down the street and there's 80 people around you, you're kind of not worried about them. So it's a practice to get there. You're young, give it like six years, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know? But I mean that kind of jokingly, but also seriously, that like, don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow or next week or next month. It's a lifelong practice. But there is progression. Say again? There is progression. I, I, I think absolutely. There is progression, but the only thing I'll caution you, and not just you saying that, but everybody, is that if we sit down and we do a meditation and we think, am I making progress yet? <laughs> then we're still wrapped up in the idea of gaining and progress. Is it progression? Absolutely. Um, it's slow, it's gradual. But if, you, if you're patient, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. What does Buddhism say about physical pain? Physical pain. Um, it says it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it doesn't say physical pain sucks. What Buddhism says about physical pain, if you have it, would be something along the lines of, you have it. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't change it. It doesn't heal it. It doesn't say it's good or bad. Right? When I say it being Buddhism, I'm just giving you the way I interpret Buddhist teachings regarding physical pain. It is extremely present. It is, in fact, one of the greatest present time awarenesses that we have. Because if you were sitting in excruciating pain, that is so present. Right? There's a uh, Buddhist teaching called the second arrow. And the first arrow would be the recognition of physical pain. Right? The second arrow would then be frustration or anger that you have physical pain. The third arrow would be sadness at the frustration and anger that you have physical pain. The next arrow would be depression, that you have sadness, that you have frustration, that you have anger about the physical pain. What Buddhism has taught me is when in physical pain, experience the physical pain as present. And if you don't add the additional emotional responses to it, it tends to make it um, a little less painful in the heart and in the mind. But back pain, knee pain, it's still pain, you know? Um, You know, chronic pain, which I, you know, I've worked with and sat with and are around a lot of people have chronic pain and, and it's, it's there. How do we respond to it mentally and emotionally is the key to it. I wish it was like, oh yeah, read seven pages and Buddhism will fix your physical pain. No, um, but our, it, it helps with our reaction to it. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say on that, and, and I know this doesn't apply for everybody, um, or anyone really when you're dealing with chronic pain actually does still too, but the impermanence of all things and The Buddha taught that all conditioned phenomena are impermanent now physical pain that is daily It'll change slightly some days better some days worse uh, Sometimes pain is temporary Then goes away sometimes it just fluctuates from painful very painful Painful, extremely painful, painful. But it's all impermanent. It changes, often not as rapidly or in the direction that we'd like, but it changes. Yeah. Here. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask uh, on the note of with, like, with regard to uh, people's desire to control others. <laughs> um, how, how do you help someone in a position of professional authority over yourself exercise compassion for those in which you have direct professional and personal interest? 
you don't. <laughs> so I'm going to attempt to paraphrase or retell the question. How do you help someone in professional capacity? They are above you in the professional world. How do you help them have compassion towards people that you are above? My response was you don't. Um, it, again, that person is going to do what they're going to do, right? Often uh, you get questions around, how do I teach this stuff to my children, right? Well, be what you want to teach, right? Now, you've been at this stuff a while. Was there ever a time in your life, say five years ago, where meditation or Buddhist practice would have been the last thing you would have thought of? So somebody walked up to him and was like, dude, you need to go meditate five years ago. What would you have said? Yeah, don't repeat it, right? <laughs> but it wouldn't have been for you. It's, you know, I always say that you enter meditation and Buddhist practice when you're ready for it. So there was a time in your life where you wouldn't have wanted to hear it, and you wouldn't have wanted to share compassion towards others. Now that it's become a part of your life, we see colleagues, we see loved ones, we see especially tough loved ones, right? When we see them suffering and we want to share the practice with them and they're not having it. Only thing we can do is continue to practice. But trying to get people into it or, you know, next time you're maybe compassionate and they're not acting with compassion and they, maybe they'll even recognize like, wow, you were kind of nice today. Well, yeah, I've been working on that. It's helping me be calmer. But as soon as you make it kind of attacking towards them, there's not much skill usually in that. And it usually backfires. What if it's not necessarily even wanting to spread teachings in so much as stave off unproductive like truly yeah, I'm not even. I'm not talking about sharing teachings. I'm talking about exactly what you're addressing. I'm not talking about turning your workplace into a little Buddhist temple. Right? I'm talking about the heart of your question, which is how to get your boss to be nice to the people that you're the boss of. And I'm saying good luck with that. <laughs> is what I'm saying. You know, it's a great question, a very common theme where people often want the Buddhist, like, you know, textbook answer. It's the recognition that there was a time in your life where you would have not been compassionate towards people you work with or, 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 or you know, overseeing. And now you are. And so you get to practice patience. Yes, you're right. <laughs> he muffled, do I ever, for those who didn't hear that. But yeah, so that's, that's the idea. And that... Um, yeah, you know, it's sad that certain people acting a certain way towards others isn't productive. Absolutely. Um, and often there's not much we can do other than practice patience and continue to share compassion. Yeah. Go ahead in the back and then we'll go here. Yeah. Um, so I was to ask you, um, since I started coming here, I've been a lot more calm. Yes. To the people in my life and situations that I've been uh, going through. Um, but uh, my question is uh, how do you deal with resentment specifically towards the resentment you have toward yourself? Yeah. So dealing with resentment or any sort of emotions towards self is very often the hardest thing to do, and I think it's also most important. You know, Buddhism talks about non-self, that the reason we suffer is because of the sense of self, the I, the ego, right? But non-self doesn't mean that we don't exist. It doesn't mean we're not important, right? There's a great Zen kind of expression of you must get to know the self before you get rid of the self. So non-self doesn't mean you're not there. You are there. And if you are there living internally with lots of hatred and anger and resentment, and frustration and disappointment towards yourself, it's going to be very difficult to have true compassion and kindness towards others. So I think I'm kind of pointing the obvious out, but I'm just talking through this. One thing that you can do is start to recognize that the resentment you're having towards yourself, how is that actually hindering, not to answer right now, but to think about this, how is that actually harming or hindering other relationships? 
with friends or family. That in a way, it's kind of selfish to be so resentful towards yourself when that's causing you to maybe not be so kind to others. You ever done anything good in your life? Yes. You ever done anything bad in your life? Yes. You ever done things in your life that really didn't matter one way or the other? Yes. All right, you're human and no different than anybody else in this room. So the sooner you start to have compassion for yourself, right? My master used to say, when you do things that harm others or yourself, recognize that what you did was coming from a place of greed, anger, and ignorance, and vow to not do it again. You know, we call those the three poisons in Buddhism. What causes our suffering is the greed, anger, or ignorance. Ignoring the true nature of reality, how things are. And in most cases, meaning that when we argue with someone, we think we're right. You ever had that happen? Yeah. Just checking, right? So recognize that the resentment you have towards yourself is because of things that you possibly did while you were greedy, you were angry, or you were ignorant. So try not to do that anymore. But holding on to that anger and resentment, you know, a lot of great memes and metaphors out there, it's like holding hot coal. When you're holding hot coal, who's getting burned? You. Set it down. Son. Yeah. And ignorance. Yeah, they call them the three poisons. Um, second noble truth is cause of suffering. First is suffering that we all experience, discomfort, angst, dissatisfaction. The second is the cause, and that's the greed, the anger, the ignorance. Third is the ending, and the fourth is the full path. Yeah. Helpful? Yeah. You can bring that hot coal, just drop it out the window. Right, you're always right by the window. Just yeah, try it. Yeah. As I listen to you, I, I find some uh, parallels with the Western religion. Yes. I bet. Catholicism. Yes. Um, at the point in my life where one seeks the wants to seek the truth, whether it be behind Buddha, right, Christ, can one in the practice of Buddhism conglomerate? Multiple religions or practices into multifaceted. Definitely. Because I find that yeah. Christ, some of those guys are some of the ideas are parallel with yes. each They would have been buddies, I'm convinced. <laughs> so the, the, the question was those in here in the back, basically um, what he's hearing, it reminds him very much of kind of Western religious teaching, specifically maybe the words of Christ. And can one within Buddhism also, you know bring it into or work within other religions. So a couple things I'll say on this. Um, yes, yes, and yes, right? Quick, is this your first time here? It is. It is, okay. Uh, well, welcome, right? Um, my first time also. Uh, quick show of hands. <laughs> Why don't you look around the room? How many of you in here are Buddhists? You see like three and a half hands, <laughs> right? <laughs> one's, one's on the fence, not I'm on the chair. It depends on what day, you know? Uh, so, none of us, I'm a Jewish kid from Del Cerro, you know, uh, the practice of Buddhism isn't about being Buddhist, I'll explain this a couple different ways, which is important for anyone who's, I think, never heard this or seen it this way. Um, the Buddha himself was Hindu. He wasn't Buddhist. He was Siddhartha Gautama, he was a prince, he was a dude who suffered and struggled and figured out the way to end suffering, and he taught that. And then he died at 80. He was raised Hindu. That was the religion at that time in India. You know, the, this is 500 years before Christ. So the idea of God that we speak of today, Christ, these other religions, didn't exist back then. They had Hindu gods and goddesses. He was asked very specifically, um, what about belief in gods and goddesses? And, and it was one of 12 questions you wouldn't answer. He said, look, I'm just a human. If you believe in gods and goddesses, you do. If you don't, you don't. I'm just teaching you how to live your life. Your belief is your belief. A good friend of mine, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, years ago, uh, she was Catholic. And she said that Buddhist teachings actually made her a better Catholic. She considered it a software upgrade. 
her Catholic faith was very devout. Now, if there's those of you who are in here who are ex-Catholics, you're like, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> and there's truly probably more of those. But the problem or the teaching isn't the Christianity or Catholicism. It's all the stuff around it. Jesus, in the Buddhist lens, again, 500 years later, is a fully enlightened bodhisattva. Right? That's the general idea of modern-day Buddhists or even historians of, of you know, a, a Buddhist uh, scholars say that, that Jesus was a fully enlightened being. Right? The religion that you follow is not the important piece. This is the Buddhist lens. I'm not saying that that's the other lens. The Buddha also said there's 84,000 paths to ending your suffering. My master used to say you could recite the name of Buddha, you could recite the name of Jesus Christ. What matters is what you do every day. Right? That's the important part. Um, someone asked the Dalai Lama years ago if this country needed more Buddhists. And he said the world has enough Buddhists. <laughs> this country just needs more people who are peaceful and happy. So it's extremely important for people who come from other religions, which is most of us here. If you get into Buddhism later on in life in the U.S. or Europe or Canada, you weren't raised Buddhist for the most part. So you begin to see how does Buddhist teachings mesh with for those who it's still important to, how does it mesh with your existing religious beliefs, if you have them? Uh, there's a great book um, we have downstairs, but uh, Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. About three months ago, I did a, uh, at a church about a mile from here with the retired uh, reverend um, on the comparisons of the teachings of Jesus and teachings of Buddha. Very similar. Very, very similar. So... You know, we didn't start Dharma Bum Temple to make people Buddhist. Um, it's not about being Buddhist. You know, again, my master used to say, shave in the head, put on a robe doesn't make you a Buddhist or a monk. It's what's in your heart. That's what's important. So, that helps with many different examples, but it's such a key, critical question as we begin to explore Buddhist teachings in a new culture you know, over the last 70 years, really, for us to understand. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, the, the reason why we have frustrations because we have cravings or uh, how about if you are craving for a professional advancement or just like for us, uh, we want to expand our business. Sure. Because of course, there's always frustration. But even if I don't, or we don't, there's always frustration. Right. Right. I mean, if there's frustration anyways, why not create expansion, right? <laughs> if I hear that correctly. The important part to understand is that craving, this is how I see craving desire, right, from the Buddhist teachings. The Buddha said there's healthy cravings, healthy desires, and there's unhealthy cravings and unhealthy desires. The craving and desire to end suffering, for example, very simple. None of us would be here if we didn't have this desire to suffer less. We'd all be sitting somewhere else. Right? But because we crave and desire to suffer less, we explore this path in practice. When it comes to professional life or anything for that matter, the best thing I, I can say is look at what the intention is behind it. With all of these teachings around Buddhism, craving, desire, what is the intention? Is it driven by greed, as I mentioned earlier, anger, ignorance? Or is it driven by compassion, by wisdom? by understanding, by forgiveness, by love. What is the intention behind it, right? You know, when I look at, say, how I was 15, 17 years ago, my view of money when I had it was really poor. How I made it, what I did with it, right? How I spent it. If I had the view now of money, I wish I had millions. The money itself is not bad. I mean, the business itself is not bad. Right livelihood. I mean, the Buddha did give very clear in the, in the uh, Pali Canon, the Vinaya, there are very clear descriptions of livelihood that he talked about that were not wholesome or healthy to have. Um, being a butcher was one of them. Um, running a brothel was one of them. Last I checked, nobody in here is doing that. Right? But there are very clear things he said around business that are not healthy or wholesome. Um, 
But my guess is, you know, your family business or whatever you're doing probably isn't harming anyone. But it's important also to ask yourself, is the expansion that you're trying to expand the business, is that causing in and of itself stress and anxiety and pressure? Because you're attached to, oh, no, we have to expand. My teachers say, Jeff, you work so hard to make so much money to buy so many things. If you didn't have so many things, you wouldn't need so much money. You wouldn't have to work so hard. It was one of the greatest teachings I ever got. So craving desire, bad, no. But it will lead to difficulties if we're not careful with it. Yeah. Intention is important when you look at Buddhist teachings to not see these words as so like concretely, but to look at what is the intention behind the actions is really critical. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. Uh, so I just see a hand. Um, yesterday morning, I was on my way to work and I got assaulted and dropped in my phone. Got punched in the face. So now I'm kind of stuck with how do I handle all these emotions and feelings of like anger, fear, and frustration from what happened. Yeah, I have to go down the same route every day to go back and forth from work, so I can pass by it twice and see that spot where it happened. So it's like, how do I deal with going about my day without falling into all these feelings and emotions? That's what it was all day today. Yeah. So if I heard you correctly. Yesterday on your way to work, you got assaulted, robbed, punched in the face. And you want to know how to deal with the emotions now of going to work every day because of the fear. Yes. So the first thing that comes to my mind, I have to say it, is that to recognize there's some people that live with that fear every single day from having done nothing and had nothing happen to them. First, recognize that. Recognize, are we someone who's actually aware of the fears that other people have to face because of the privilege we may have. I'm sure this isn't why you're bringing up the question, but I still got to say it. It's an awareness of, oh no, wait a minute, now I'm afraid. What about everybody else? There are people walking around every single day that are afraid. Now we know what it's like. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver because of your one experience what it may be like for them. First and foremost, I think focus on that. I mean, you're here, right? I, I can't, all I can see like your eye and your ear, right? But you, you seem to be, did you walk in here? You seem to be moving okay and everything, right? Physically, you survived? Physically, yeah. Physically survived and mentally and emotionally, now you're a mess, yeah. right? Be with that mess. Use it as a way to appreciate what it was like to walk down the street and not have had that happen. There's no answer to this. And it's, it's a funny thing, and I'll, I'll kind of get close with this thought a little bit, is that if you think again to all of these questions, it's about how do I, how do I, how do I? That's the nature of almost every question in these classes. And I get it. I, I, I. The practice isn't about I. If you walk down that street tomorrow and you look around and you think to yourself, I wonder if they're afraid. I wonder if they're afraid. I wonder if they're afraid. You know what that takes the focus off of? You. And when you're focused on others, you're all right. That's how. The question isn't how do you do that. The question is, will you do that? Will you walk down that street tomorrow on the way to work and think about your fear? Or will you think about the fear of others? Because your mind can really only focus on one thing at one point in time. That thing will shift. That thing will change. How long is your walk to work? Or how long is your walk on that street? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So you got 15 minutes to think about the fear and safety of others. That's a beautiful practice. I'm glad you're 
seemingly physically okay. I'm sorry for the mental, emotional trauma that you experienced. Um, but in some ways, grateful for the experience that you now have to know what it's like to maybe walk in other shoes who may not have the privilege that you may have. So thank you for caring for everybody when you walk to work tomorrow. Yeah. Most of these questions that we ask, it's not about how will I. It's about will I. We know how. We're just not often willing to do it. You all know how to be nice. <laughs> but will you? We all know how to forgive someone. But will we? We all know how to be kind and caring towards others. But will we? Anything else before we close? And I probably could have given you a more compassionate answer, but I felt the answer I gave you was the wisest one. And uh, this practice is about wisdom and compassion. So my intention was to kindly and compassionately choose what I think is the wisest direct path to help you cut through your fear, which is to not make it about you. And we can all apply that to our lives with things that we're afraid of. What are others afraid of? Anything else before we close? Yeah. It's my uh, first time here. Um, I've always had questions about uh, enlightenment or nirvana. I get the terminology mixed up. But when, when one is enlightened, is that a sense of peace or is that like a sense of euphoria or is it more of a... I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I can tell you what unenlightened feels like. <laughs> it's 8.04 and I want to try to end on time, but I could spend the next 17 hours talking about what unenlightened feels like. <laughs> and it's what all of us in this room feel every moment of our lives, except for like a rare split second that we make the world not about us. And then we have this feeling of enlightenment and that lasts for about maybe two seconds. So it's like balance. Okay. It's not balance. No, balance, balance, like you go. It's, my point is, I'm trying to cut through the heart of this. Don't try to figure out what enlightenment or nirvana is. It's an absolute waste of your time. Try to figure out why you're suffering. There's a great expression that says, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, Chop wood, carry water. Don't fault my suggestion, and this is how I approach Buddhist practice. I don't wake up every day and think, when am I going to attain enlightenment? Or am I going to enter into nirvana? I think, can I be a kinder, gentler, happier person today than I was yesterday? Focus on that. That will probably keep you busy for a while. Right? And then that whole enlightenment stuff, Maybe that someday will arrive. But ultimately, the teaching says we're all already awakened. I'll close with this thought because I think it's a beautiful metaphor, right, specifically to this question. The Buddha said we're all already awakened. We're enlightened already, all of us. We don't have to get on the freeway and go 30 miles. We don't have to fly around the world and sit on a mountaintop in Nepal, right? We are all already awakened. We're just not aware of it. Look how much money I just saved you. Right? Thinking, thinking you had to go to India or Nepal or something, you know what I mean? Like, it's like two grand in your pocket right there. But the metaphor is like on a cloudy day. Is the sun still there? On a cloudy day. But do you see it? No. Why not? Clouds. Clouds. So when the clouds part, what's there? It's the sun. So the clouds. That's our, what I referenced earlier, the three poisons, the greed, the anger, the ignorance, the pride, the ego, the self. 
Those are the clouds. When those clouds part within us, bodhicitta, Buddha nature, is there. The awakened being is there. It's not our destination. Yeah. Good luck. So I'm going to close on that. We'll join palms. May the benefit of this practice be shared with all beings in all directions. May all be at peace. May all be free from suffering. May any merit gained from this practice be transferred to Max during his time of suffering and his family and friends who suffer at this time.